live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and today we'll ask the question, is the idea of retirement dying? We'll chat about whether we should gear up to work forever with the host of the personal finance podcast, Andrew Giancola. Plus, we'll be joined by our favorite hustler who may never retire, mostly because she loves what she does, Paula Pant. And finally, our resident third panelist, Oh G. <laughs> wow. But <laughs> that's as worked up as I could get about that. But that's not all. Halfway through the show, I'll share my captive trivia question. And now a guy who'd lock himself inside to work on bringing you the best personal finance advice. It's Joe Osalcia. Nights and weekend stackers, and I'd love every minute of it. This is so fun, and we're about to bring the fun today because, well, we have an interesting topic. We have phenomenal panelists this week, and... We have a trivia competition that's coming down to the end. I am Joe Saul Cihai, Average Joe Money on Twitter, X, whatever the hell you call it today. And uh, we're going to have some fun talking about is retirement, do we have the death rattle in retirement? We'll introduce our guest of honor last, but let's start off with the gentleman across the card table from me, Mr. OG's here. How are you, dude? I've got the death rattle in my chest. You you had that on Wednesday, too. Yes. More day it's quill. Odd. It's odd. It's like it's like it's 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 like I'm trapped in this one day of sickness. <laughs> just over progressively over. is getting worse as as this day is going on. It's like Groundhog Day of, like of, of of sickness. Uh, well, I hope you can hang in there to help people figure out this retirement conundrum. So, is it true? Is Doug right? Paula Pant it afford anything? Are you never going to retire? I, I hope to never retire. My dream is to be like Betty White, who is 99 years old and still working and totally loving it. You could tell Betty White at 99 having a great time. That's who you, I hope to be. You know, my feeling about this, Paula, you've heard me tell other people that that if I'm like, you know, if I'm podcasting when I'm 99 with like an oxygen like Don Imus had, you know, mm -hmm. and how great would it be for ratings if I died right in the middle of a show? Like that, that would just be, did you hear the podcast where the dude like kicked it halfway through the, like, that would be huge. Aww. That would be, no, 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 no. no. P and it, it, people would say it was a deep fake anyway. <laughs> That's that is true. Who would die on the show? And the guy wondering what the hell he's spending his life doing with us. The guy behind the personal finance podcast finally here. Andrew Giancola joins us. How are you, buddy? I am so excited to be here. And I didn't know mom's basement was BYOB, but here we are. Yes, it is. I'm sorry. I apologize. We, uh, yeah, well, you know, when you, when you hang out with Doug, uh, you can't keep the freezer full or the beer fridge. Exactly. Well, I brought mine, so don't worry about it. <laughs> Just to keep it away from Doug. And I think you're good. Uh, for the three people that don't know what the best name show in our business, is, the personal, ha, huh, Paul, I wonder what it's about. The personal finance <laughs> podcast. I think it's a little subtle. Andrew, what goes on at the personal finance podcast? <laughs> Essentially, what we do is we talk about personal finance. That's the main oh, thing that we talk about. I just imagine the, the day, Andrew, you were like, you got to be kidding me. That name's still available. I, and it, we started it in 2020 and I could not believe it was available. So we are colliding the most boring name in the world with the coolest name in the world. So that's that's perfect. That's fantastic. I don't know if it's boring, but you have a ton of fun on your show. It's great. Your YouTube page, also a bunch of fun. We'll link to all those in our show notes, along with what Paul is doing at Afford Anything. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a great time. And the piece we're going to talk about today, there is a piece in Canada that this was written by a Canadian author about the death of retirement. We'll dive into that in just a second. But before that, Andrew, are you are you familiar with the rules, the things that you have to go through before you retire? I am familiar with some of them. Oh, well, let me go through the list and we'll see if we get them all. How about that ninth one? That's the best one overall. Well, wait till you hear number 12. Hold on. Right. Am I right? That is that's that's completely right. It is incredible. We got Andrew here. We got Paula. We got OG neighbor Doug in the driver's seat. So let's go. This piece comes to us from a publication called The Walrus, and it's the end of retirement. By the way, 
As I mentioned, we'll link to it in the show notes, but you really don't have to follow it uh, to follow along with today's discussion. Uh, But it might be fun reading later. The writer of this piece, Catherine Bradbury, writes, I'm standing on my back stoop looking out at the 80 or so people jammed in the backyard for my retirement party. They're here to celebrate my 40 years in journalism. There's the gang from Domino Fashion Magazine, where I got my start in the can't spend enough cocaine stoked 80s. The Globe and Mail crew from the ambitious middle of my career hang out with the colleagues from McLean's, the Toronto Star and Metro. I moved around a lot. The CBC News crowd are huddled to my left, protecting themselves and their fat budgets from the circling sharks of underfunded journalism. My final job was with them. Just behind, beyond the guest and beyond the hornbeam trees where I've strung fairy lights to the party, I think I can see my future. The grind of work is finally over my retirement dream queued up april in paris reading by the sea spanish lessons in antigua so i can better speak to my grandson i'll be playing with him too in the open-ended days my children rarely knew with me i'm not saying i deserve a life of ease but i worked hard to earn my retirement dropping chunks of my salary giant chunks into the company and government pension plans throughout those 40 years it's time for the famous social contract to hold up its end of the bargain and take care of me the way it did my father before me to deliver on the idea that retirement is my right after a life of work and the promise I'll never have the time and means to enjoy it. Sounds good so far, right, everybody? But then she writes, except none of that happened. The year since my retirement party has not been a dreamy passage to welcome future, but a nerve shattering trip into the unknown. And then she goes into talking about how her debt swelling, her hard won savings might or might not get sucked into the vortex of an international market collapse. Can she keep her house? Who knows? She writes, the macro economy is messing with my micro economy. Andrew, you know, this this coming year is uh, the start of an election year. People always feel uncertain, but definitely this year, the hyperbole, I think, is going to be not even 11. It's going to be at a 12 or 13. This uncertainty is going to feel more real than ever. Do you think she's got a good point here that that you know what this certain quote retirement might not be so certain? I think she definitely has a great point here and I have my parents are around this age where they are all their friends and them are in the the retirement age the traditional retirement age of you know 59 60 61 62 within that range and all of them that I have talked to are all uncertain about their retirement because they're worried about things like inflation for example um, and so they all don't know if they have enough money. And I think this concept of enough is a huge factor for a lot of people figuring out what that enough number is and then figuring out is that goalpost needing to move based on some of these inflation rates. So I think this is definitely something that a lot of people are worried about right now. Paula, we've got the fire movement on one end trying to retire as soon as we can. We got this piece on the whole other end going, hey, I'm retired. It sucks. Like it, it's a lot of uncertainty. Like, 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 what do we do if we're in the fire move? I'm not even retired yet. And I'm listening to this r- retired writer go. Meh. <laughs> well, you know, the thing is retirement, the way it's traditionally done is it's this. First of all, it's completely binary. You're either working full time or you are fully retired. There is no tapering off typically for a, for the average person, or, or at least in the way that retirement, traditional retirement has been uh, yeah. historically defined, right? Second of all, there's this big thing that you're major, major life event. You have never done a test drive of it. You've never taken an unpaid sabbatical from work for one year to see how you will fare emotionally, mentally, with the absence of a paycheck living on accumulated savings, right? If, some, if behavior like that was normalized, and people took mini retirements, let's say once a decade, right? When you turn 30, when you turn 40, when you turn 50, when you, you'd you at least have a couple of test runs so that you know, hey, five months into not earning a paycheck, this is messing with me psychologically. And, and going from a, accumulation to spend is not something that I'm really equipped to do, right? What's great about the FIRE movement is that in the FIRE movement, Retirement is not the cessation of income producing activity. Retirement is, for many people, a momentary cessation that's maybe three months, six months, maybe a year, heck, maybe two years. And then after heck, that. Let's go three. Come on. <laughs> sure, sure. Why not three? But then after that, it is typically really a midlife career change. And because it is a very, very well funded, 
midlife career change, often with a prolonged break in the middle, it allows people to test drive what retirement can feel like. I want to get to that well-funded here in a second because I've got some statistics that, Doug, you found that uh, I want to get to on that note in a second. Before we get there, oh, gee, looking at retirement, we, we've we had higher than normal inflation lately. You know, she, she's talking about this piece about pensions, somebody retiring 20 years ago, a pension, maybe, maybe not, but but more than 50 percent of prob- uh, people probably had a pension back then. Uh, Social Security reform. We heard uh, lots of big news last week about one of the candidates in the United States talking about some pretty serious Social Security reform. Are we better off if we just say, you know what, I'm not going to plan to retire. And if I do, that's great. But my plan is to never do it. I think that when it comes to the word retirement itself is an inaccurate description of what most people want to do. Um, I think what, what everybody is searching for is financial independence. And, and that enables you to do whatever the heck it is that you want to do, whether or not you make a boatload of money for it or not a lot of money or you spend 40 hours a week doing it or four hours a week doing it. You know, at the end of the day, um, how you get there is not so much about, you know, which one of these tools are, 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 are going to get me there. Nor is it about like, I can't wait to be done, but rather I can't wait to get to the point where I can do something different. You know, recently we, we saw Charlie Munger pass away and Paula mentioned Betty White you know, from some months ago, has it been a year yet? Maybe I don't even know, but it, it, it all goes too fast. Yeah. That's the sad thing. I mean, so the interesting thing for both of those people is that they were, they were still doing what they wanted to do. I'm, I'm certain that Betty White was financial independent, financially independent. I know Charlie Munger was, you know, for, for, for roughly, you know, 90 of his 99 years, I suspect, <laughs> 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 you know, so if there's a theme, if there's a common, you know, uh, uh, recipe card for success when it comes to financial independence, it's not that I can't wait to be done. And then I just sit on my butt and don't do anything. That's not, that's not what we, that we don't see that as like the recipe for success. We see people who continue to do the things that provide energy and provide for other people in some way, shape or form. But if that thing you want to do doesn't involve making money though, OG. Yeah, that's fine. Absolutely. I mean, because financial independence is the point at which you get to decide what you want to spend your time on. And it's not necessarily about money. I did initially when I was preparing. I had a couple other questions, but you guys are you guys are forcing my hand. What I love about our Friday roundtables is I have no idea which way we're going to. I kind of know a little bit about where we're going to go, but we're going to go here way sooner because this is the way you guys are pulling me, both Paula and O.G., Yahoo Finance has this piece that Doug found uh, written by Janine Mancini. Can you guess how many Americans successfully retire with one million saved? The percentage may shock you. Now, a lot of our stackers are money nerds and they go a million dollars. That's not a lot. We've talked about that here before, right? Million dollars. That's a forty thousand dollar a year lifestyle. You need two million. Well, when you take a look at the numbers, Janine says saving for retirement is an essential goal for many Americans, but achieving the ideal savings target remains elusive for many. In 2023, the average American retiree had about 170,726, about, I love the word about, about 170,726 and 36 cents. No, I just added the 36 cents in in retirement savings. A decrease though, listen to this, a decrease from 191,000, this 10% reduction significantly Significantly lower than the recommended. Who the hell recommended this number? Than the recommended five hundred and fifty-five thousand. I've never heard anybody recommend five hundred and 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 fifty-five thousand. Only, only twelve percent of retirees have achieved or exceeded this recommended savings amount. So, Andrew, to you, Paul is talking about financial independence and a midlife career change. It's well financed. OG's talking about that's what we're searching for. We got very few people actually with any savings at all 
it, I think that is a, a major factor. Now you can see all the numbers that even came out within the last year um, from from the government side where they were talking about, you know, the average net worth by age. And they went through all of these different numbers and they were extremely low for folks who should be around retirement age. And so for a lot of people, if they have this low, low amount when they get to retirement age, there's a lot of different things that they may have to rely on. Most people are trying to rely on Social Security and most people are trying to rely on some of these additional things. But I think there are some creative ways that you can come up with where you can find things that you are interested in and utilize that to make money in retirement in a way that isn't like a nine to five job, for example. So I think there are some creative things that we can talk through. Um, but this is something where I definitely think it's a major issue for a lot of folks. Well, well, let me uh, let me stick with you for a second then. So same question I, I asked OG, would it be better then for the average person based on those numbers I just gave you to say, you know what, I'm not going to ever retire. Maybe I'll put a few dollars aside, plan on working the rest of my life. And hey, if I can use this for a few well-funded days or months or years off, that's a better plan. So I think that this is a really, really interesting topic because I think for a lot of people, they don't understand the flexibility that they have. So say, for example, I kind of compare this to something like barista fire, but you can do this later on in your life as well, where if you don't know what barista fire is, it was kind of developed by the fire movement. And early on, it's where you kind of supplement your income with a side job. Now, it was called Barista Fire originally because people would say, for example, they needed a million dollars just to make the numbers work. I don't do public math. So say, for example, they needed a million dollars and they had $750,000 saved up. Well, they needed to make an additional $250,000, make up that number to supplement their lifestyle throughout that time frame. So this is something where they need an additional $10,000 if you utilize the 4% rule every single year in order to supplement that. So when, the, when you do that, you can say, hey, can I work a side job or a side gig that supplements that? Well, that is something where you can kind of do this math in retirement as well. But I like the idea of doing this in a flexible way, in a way that is surrounding your interests. So say, for example, you're really interested in fishing, for example. You can go out and become a fishing captain. Can you make up that amount you know, by fishing once a week or twice a week and teaching people how to fish? Or if you're really interested in yoga, can you become a yoga instructor once a week or twice a week? This is, I think, one way that you can supplement this income and still be in enjoying your retirement over that time frame. So I do think it is, if you want to retire and you don't want to work, I think that can be one definition. But for a lot of people, staying busy also can increase longevity. It can do a lot of different things for your lifestyle. And I think it's really, really important to kind of see that there is flexibility in this. It's funny you say that back to the original piece. Uh, the author writes, anyone retiring in Canada right now can expect to live until 80 women until 84, but those numbers are averaged out. She says, when I began to discuss retirement with my financial planner in early 2022, he put my life expectancy at 94. Why, thank you, I said. I do try to keep fit. No, said Benjamin Klein, Senior Portfolio Manager at Baskin Wealth Management. I thought Baskin was where I got ice cream, but apparently not. Baskin Wealth Management, ice cream and mutual funds. Maybe that's 32 it. 32 flavors. <laughs> 32 the 30 ETFs to choose flavor. from. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Benjamin says life expectancy is not randomized. We factor in your gender genetics, access to good healthcare, education, lifestyle. That's, that's how long you'd live. Paula, we look at so few people with retirement savings in one piece, longevity on the other. I mean, this creates this, this huge gap and maybe she's not wrong for a lot of people about the death of retirement. <laughs> well, so first of all, retirement and financial planning generally is the only uh, area in which longevity is considered a risk, right? Anywhere else, longevity is considered. <laughs> You're high fiving yourself. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, lo longevity is considered. Oh crap! The I'm still alive. Son yeah, of exactly. <laughs> <laughs> in fitness, in health, in medicine, longevity is what we is is the optimal outcome. That's what we're you know starting in, if we're if we're future thinking, starting in our 20s or our 30s, ideally, we are optimizing for longevity into our 90s, 100s, 110s. But yeah. funding that, Paula. Right, right. So I think that, you know, the the typical you retire at 60 and you have a 30 year retirement, you retire at 60 and you live to 90. I think that that needs to be rethought really among everyone, because if you are currently young, then you have decades and decades of a the ability to practice you know good fitness good nutrition good good lifestyle choices b you also have um all of the the new 
medical and technological advances that are going to emerge in the next 50 years, you have all of that at your disposal. So if you're young, you're in a great spot. But likewise, if you are already in your 80s, you're like, assuming that you're in decent health, your likelihood of living to 100 is quite great, right? Because you're, you've already made it uh, past the great filter, right? You've already made it past, um, you know, into the your great 80. filter. <laughs> It's what a great I, garbage disposal yeah. in the sky. My takeaway from Paula just gave me a big re- revelation. If you're a little light on savings, break out the bacon and the cigarettes. I mean, you just, <laughs> <laughs> there's no the, point. <laughs> have some fun because you you can outlive your money. Because for you, Doug, because for you, it's about quality, not quantity. That's right. You don't want quantity. You certainly want quality. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Let's let's talk about this though. OG. You know, is there is there a downside of planning on income forever? Andrew talks about barista fire. Paula talks about a well-funded second career. Is there a downside to going, you know what? I'm going to plan to never retire. Before I answer that, I, I want to go back to what the article said here, where she said that she was meeting with her financial planner in 2022 to discuss her retirement plan. And the way that I interpret that is this is the first time she's had that discussion you know and maybe that maybe that's not the case but i'm i'm thinking about this like hey i'm ready to retire let's sit down and work on this as opposed to thinking about it for the 10 or 15 or 20 years prior to where where you can have that transition that becomes a little bit more fulfilling along the way it's like tax planning versus somebody filling in the boxes later yeah. I mean, Hey, I retired. Can I do that? <laughs> it's like, well, I hope so. <laughs> you know, it's like, now when's the best time to retire? Like, I, I mean, when's the best time to start planning it? Like now, you know, it is. And, and you can think about those things. And I think a good counselor along the way will have some of those questions for you that, that maybe you're not thinking about like, well, what the heck am I going to do every day? You know, and how, do, how can I stress test some of these random events that seem to always pop up in the least opportune times like market declines or inflation or, you know, political instability or whatever. Let's, let's game plan that in 2023 for all you retirees for 2030 because you got seven years to think about it versus like going, Oh crap. I retired in January. Oh, what happens in presidential election years again? Should I be concerned about this? It's like, well, yeah, last year you should have thought about it, but you already, you know, you already signed the papers. So um, anyways, I guess that's my plug for thinking about this a little Early bit further in advance. Yeah. Yeah. So back to, back to my question to you then, if, if you decide, you know what, I'm going to plan like I'm never going to retire. Is there a downside to that? No, I don't think so. Because, because then you actually have to do it. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? I guess the downside, if there is a downside, the downside is you can't be wrong. You just have to do that then for the rest of your life. I, I think that most people, when it comes to savings and investing for retirement, think that they're running out of time when in reality they have tons and tons of time. I think that most people have this idea of retirement being like, I want to retire early at 55. And then when you start pushing the the questions around like, well, what are you going to do every day? And, and, I, and I've said this before, it's like people say like, I want to play golf. I'm going to play golf every day. Like, all right, cool. Have you done that? Have you literally played golf every day for a week? Cause your back hurts. I mean, it just is tired. It's, and let's say that Doug's, you're actually. Doug's, Doug's ego hurts when he does yeah, well, that yeah. several yeah. days in a row. <laughs> that's, and that's I hit true. too many balls in the water. So yeah. I'd be completely yeah. broke spinning around <laughs> right. golf balls the entire time. <laughs> you, we have to really plan on, you know, from a, from a financial planning standpoint, it's like, well, we're going to be downgrading to top flights from here on out. Exactly. Just so, you know, <laughs> Rock your, golf, flights. your golf ball expense. But even if that's the case, it's like, all right, that's a four hour adventure, right? So you tee off at eight, you're done at noon. What are you going to do the rest of the day, every day for the rest of your life? And you go, well, I'm going to hang out with my friends. Oh, are you? Because all your friends are still working. I mean, it doesn't mean that you have to keep working, but you can think about that stuff in advance. So I don't think it's bad to think about, you know, a life worked. Uh, Dana Osbach said that, you know, a life well worked. That was such a great line that she said. Uh, several years ago on the show, but if there is a downside to, you know, to, 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 to not thinking about it is that I guess it could lead you to being a little bit more YOLO-y than you probably should be. Andrew, any downsides you can think of to, uh, 
to planning on working the rest of your life? I don't see a ton of downsides, especially if you're in, you know, healthy condition and you have something that you really, really enjoy and love that you are working for a longer period of time. Like for me, for example, I plan on working for a, a very long period of time, uh, even throughout retirement, because I enjoy the work that I do. And so I think if you enjoy what you're doing, this is why I always bring in that barista fire example. If you enjoy what you're doing, then it's something where if you do it a couple of days a week, if you need to supplement your income and or if you even need to work longer periods of time, if it's something that you enjoy doing, it's not going to be as bad as if it's a job that you absolutely hate where you're working in a cubicle or something along those lines. I think I think Barista Fire though for me is the best example because when I see people that do that all day whenever I'm in a coffee shop, I think there's nothing I'd rather not do right. than that. Like God bless those people that love doing that and that and and that do that and I'm definitely not making fun of anybody that works in a coffee shop because I think you're doing phenomenal work and I love it when I get coffee there. But for me, that's why I'm glad, Andrew, people are individuals, because I'm like, I hear barista fire. I'm like, nope. <laughs> and I, I almost wish they would rebrand it. I guess we could rebrand it to like flexible fire or something like that, where yeah. it's something that Flex you fi. have the option. Flex fire. Yeah, that sounds cool. Uh, where, where you have that option to be able to kind of just do the thing surrounding what you enjoy. And I can give you an example of this, too, where we just did this recently, where my uh, my father retired or he got he got laid off at 54 and he thought he was too old. Um, to go back and find a job for so for the last couple of years, he was kind of waiting and trying to figure out what he wanted to do. And he fell in love with the game of pickleball. And so if you guys have ever played pickleball before, it is like a, one of the fastest growing sports in the world. And so he started especially playing for, if you're over 50. Exactly, exactly. And so he started playing like all the time and, and people down here and where I am in Tampa, Florida, they play all over the place. Um, and so he started to play all the time and then realized he really, really loves this sport. And then him and I found this indoor pickleball facility. Um, and we started to play at this facility together and it was a really like really cool place. It had air conditioning and in Tampa, it's so hot here. It's miserable to play outside. And so just a couple of months ago, we bought this facility from the, the previous wow. owner and now he's in there day to day and he's loving it. He gets all these pros come in, he gets free paddles. Like it's all these different things. And he's there every single day. He's there right now doing the operations. And then I do all the back end stuff. But it's one of those things where like it it's something that he absolutely loves and he fell in love with it and he found it over time. And so now he's doing this day in and day out and couldn't be happier. That's a different podcast. Maybe next time you're on, we'll talk about that because as you know, there's a difference between playing pickleball all the time and running a pickleball operation. Like it just, you know, it's a whole different set of stuff. I know um, one guy who's one of the biggest board game reviewers on earth, a guy named Tom Vassell. I talked to him about it and he's like, I got into this because I love games and I was going to be around all the new games. He's like, I have to play like 18 new games a week and make videos on all these games. He's there are days and weeks where this just sucks. And it's like, be, you know, beware what you wish for because it's a different thing. Absolutely. I completely agree with that, too. So we could, we could definitely talk through that on another episode. But I yeah. think it is one of those things where if you can find that flexibility where it's kind of the perfect amount of time, you yeah. make enough money to cover your expenses. I think there is a dynamic there where you can really make it work. Paul, I want to go uh, to you to to kind of kick off the last question before we go to the, our, our trivia challenge. Dan in our community, who's who's a friend of the show, lives in Minneapolis, has, has always said that, you know, sometimes as we money geeks, we throw around these big numbers. We throw it like 555,000. And I said earlier in the show, I quote, I'm like, who suggests that number? But you and I both know there's people out there that hear that number and they're like, I'll never get there. Like, there's no way I can get to 550. And, and, and then I said, well, two, a million, no, two million, maybe. Now I freaked out people even more. So, so uh, how much is even just this topic, quote, scaring the kids? As my mom used to say, we don't want to scare the kids, right? <laughs> Well, I think the risk with throwing out numbers is that you're when you're in mass communication is that you are talking to an audience that makes, you know, some people make thirty thousand or forty thousand dollars a year. Others make three hundred thousand or four hundred thousand dollars a year. Right. We're talking to an audience where literally there's an order of magnitude difference in income. And so to throw out any type of raw number um, doesn't make sense in that context. I think it makes a lot more sense to speak in terms of percentages. And I'll give you an example. When I was, I was in my mid twenties, um, I was making about $25,000 a year. And uh, I remember going on Twitter. This is like the early, early days of Twitter. 
And it was back when tweet chats were really popular. And I was in some retirement planning tweet chat because I was, that was what I did in my 20s. Um, and uh, You were so crazy. <laughs> right? <laughs> Just getting nuts. That's how I spent my 20s. <laughs> yeah. I have some gin and juice and jump on the old <laughs> tweeter machine. So I'm, I'm in this retirement planning tweet chat. And I mentioned that I had saved $5,000 last uh, in the past year. I had saved $5,000. And everyone immediately was like, well, that's not enough. That's not, that's nowhere close to enough. And for me, that was one fifth of my income, right? So it was so disheartening to hear that a, fully a fifth of my income was not enough. Particularly, you know, at that end of the income bracket, 20% is, is more dear because more of it is used for necessities. You know, 20% is, is far more dear to you than it is when yeah. you have a much wider discretionary birth. So, um, so I, I just remember everyone had that very knee jerk reaction to the expression of a raw number. And that's a lesson that I haven't forgotten as I can, I talk uh, to wide audiences as, as do you, uh, as do all of us here. Right. When, you know, that that's the risk of using these numbers. We're scaring the kids. Yeah. And we definitely don't want to do that. The second half for that very reason, we're going to start giving you solutions so that if you want to get retirement moving, if you're one of those people that hasn't saved, don't feel like you've saved enough. Or even if you have, you want it for motivation. We're going to jump on those. And the second half of the show, but between now and then, we have all year long this glorious competition for maybe the worst prize in all of sports, which uh, for those of you watching our video of this is the uh, trophy right over OG shoulder that we found at a dollar store. I think the base is uneven. I'm fairly certain that uh, it isn't. Is it inscribed? I think we stuck something on there, OG, and it might have come off. Uh, no, it's a uh, <clears throat> it's a dry erase. It's a drip. Perfect. So, <laughs> yes. Well, and that's the question is, are we going to dry erase it or not? Because Andrew, today you're playing on team Len Penzo uh, and Len OG and Paula have been doing this all year long. Well, uh, Paulette Perhatch actually filled in for Paula while she finished this thing. She never talks about at Columbia. Um, the thing she's, she's very quiet about that. She did. We, we less than you talk about Bavaria. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe slightly uh uh this year-long competition andrew do you want the good news or the bad news about being on team len let's start with the bad news well the bad news is and i don't like our guests to have to do this but you have to guess first okay. and the reason is is that you are winning you have 17 points after a big win last week og has 15 which means he's got to win this one and he's got to win next week to force a tie. And by the way, we have a better tiebreaker uh, idea than uh, college football had, where, Andrew, your uh, Florida State Seminoles, man, did they get screwed. Uh, we've got a better tiebreaker system. We won't share it until we get there. But, uh, yeah, how does it feel being a Florida State Seminole right now? It is one of the worst feelings in the entire world, but at least we don't have to play the game that we've got to get, we would have gotten killed in anyway. I, I look at the bull you got. <laughs> That's gonna. It's, we're gonna. We're gonna get killed anyway. But it's, a tough road one to way or the other. You're right. Yeah. I, I think you might want to start drinking early. That one, Andrew. <laughs> It's going to be an all-day event, that's for sure. I don't know. It'll be certainly fun to see, man, if they hang in there the entire game, how great that will be for college football. Just to go, what if they would have had a shot? That'd be that'd be awesome. But anyway, you are, uh, you've are you got 17 points. OG is 15. Let's turn to Paula. Paula, you managed to be almost, I think, at some point in first place, and you've assumed yeah. your rightful place with 13. <laughs> the lead was mine to blow <laughs> <laughs> and week in and week out you but, find a way to get it done you know what this is perfectly in character and on brand don't let anyone say that i am inconsistent paula you and i were talking uh uh, uh a few days ago without mm -hmm. the mics present about the fact you said you know what i'm gonna lobby that we have a better prize than the trophy and then me not realizing, I looked at you like you're from the moon, that you didn't know that last year uh, our good friend Eric Williams in Detroit was nice enough to donate a cake from Milk Bar to the winner. That's and Paula, amazing. you said Milk Bar 
the best cakes on the planet. Milk bar. I mean, this this is not an ad. This is just a. I've never known that cake could be that good. Oh, gee, was cake that good? Was it that good last year? I remember it being pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Eric, uh, Eric has been nice enough to donate the cake again. And I think, Paula, you said something like you might have tried harder if you knew. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> so so next year, 2024, I am gunning for this milk bar cake because it's just wow. It's what a cake. What and how's she going to do it, Joe? She's going to bring in somebody to sit in for her for three quarters <laughs> of the year this time. Because that's been the proven yeah. way to keep Paula in the, in the <laughs> race. Right. All right. Is Paula going to be the spoiler? Is OG going to be able to uh, notch, notch uh, one win in two in a row that he needs? Can Andrew spoil it for everybody? He's like, I don't get any of the milk bar. Who cares? <laughs> Doug, you've got the question, man. What are we doing? Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. On this date in 1955, Johnny Cash released one of his biggest hits, Folsom Prison Blues. Cash himself never actually set foot in a prison until after the song's release, when prisoners across the country started requesting him to perform. I wonder who books those. I mean, I know some close-up magic tricks from when I was a kid. I could be a touring funny magician. I bet I'd be a hit with the inmates. Ironically, Cash started his prison tour at Huntsville State Prison and didn't perform at Folsom until 1968. According to country music legend, at least one of his shows was attended by none other than Merle Haggard, who was in prison in San Quentin for second-degree burglary. I'd and never that, heard that before. That, that's so interesting. There's a thing called second-degree burglary, or are you talking about the Merle Haggard part? Merle, Merle Haggard. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's not like accidental burglary. Yeah, I don't uh, want anybody to think about Joe Salcii in second-degree second burglary. burglary. But anyway, let's go. <laughs> I bet Merle could have snuck out with Johnny's band if they planned ahead. I mean, how hard could it be? Merle could have just told the guards that he was like the band's opening act or something. Musical acts of all genres have performed in prisons over the years, from Bonnie Tyler to Frank Sinatra and the Count Basie Orchestra. While a small portion of a prison's budget goes to entertainment, nearly half is spent on security. In California, where Folsom Prison is located, it costs an average of $106,000 per year to house a single prisoner. I keep a close eye on a criminal in my house for half that. Today's trivia question is, how much did it cost to house a prisoner for a year back when Cash wrote Folsom Prison Blues back in 1955? I'll be back right after I find my trick deck cards. You gotta get practicing. All right, Andrew, you're kicking it off. 1955, it cost over $100,000 to house a prisoner day. What was that? 106000 106 now. What was it in 1955? I'm going to say $7,024. S- sounds like you did some math. I'm trying to, but I don't do mental math like I said earlier. But we'll see. <laughs> we'll see how it pans out. So one more time, Andrew, that was what round, rough, approximate number? Right. $7,000. We'll go round it down to seven. Oh, he changes the answer to 7000 All right. Oh, gee. We decided I'm second. This doesn't seem you, right. You, you are second. You're in second place. Because you're in second place. Yeah. So when do we go which place we're in? We go on who, who won, right? Previous We've been week. doing it this way. Who's in the lead? <laughs> you are hopped up on day quill, dude. Whoever's in the lead goes first. <laughs> it fluctuates. Yep. And whoever's in last place goes last. It's like 70, per, 70 years ago, basically. I'm going to say it's just a little bit more than 7,000. Uh, I'm going to say the answer is uh, 17,000. 17. $319. <laughs> and 11 cents <laughs> all right paula you've got seven and 17 well since i can't win the question is what answer do i give that has the best chance of spoiling it just depends on who you want to spoil <laughs> <laughs> Well, 
Well, when I first heard the question, the the number that popped into my head was 22,000. So normally I would take the over. But I also want to knock Len out of his place. Oh, I like this. Yeah. So so I think capping Len at the knees is the the best uh, oh. approach. She's an angry elf today. <laughs> <laughs> So, Andrew, your guess was 7,000? 7,000. All right. I'm going to go 7,001. 7,000. Okay. And one. (laughs) All right. We got the numbers locked in. Ken OG forced it to go to the last week. Will Paula pull the spoiler? Is Len raising the trophy? And Andrew today getting to raise a trophy on his behalf. We'll let you know in just a minute. Andrew, you kicked it off with $7,000. The good news is if it's less than that, Paula gave you the under. Absolutely. I'm hoping it is less than that, but we'll see what happens here. Uh, uh, OG, you are way out there at 17000 bucks. Feeling good? I, I don't have any idea. Sorry. <laughs> and Paula, you took 7001 giving you a lot of room between her and, and OG. I'm, I, I mean, I've got her. nothing to lose. I mean him. <laughs> yes sorry andrew i just i just uh change your pronouns did you just gender him (laughs) i I don't know where that came from all right well we are locked in are we going to another week of trivia doug you got it man what's our answer hello i'm neighbor doug (laughs) That's my best Johnny Cash. I'm close up magician and man in whatever color clothes are clean. Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. During the break, I practiced my close up magic trick for Joe's mom. And she kept saying she doesn't know how I'm still doing it at my age. But she did recommend I maybe visit a penitentiary or two. I bet she did. (laughs) I'm an even better magician than I was before. Today's trivia question is how much did it cost to house a prisoner for a year in Folsom prison in 1955? California is the home of Folsom State Prison as well as 33 other facilities that currently cost over $100,000 a year to house a prisoner in the Golden State. And if you were to adjust the cost in 1955 for inflation, the bill to the state should have been about $3,300 way back then. But that's way off the price tag that it actually cost to house a prisoner at Folsom for a year in 1955, which was... $6,705 $6,705 less than what Paula guessed, sixty seven oh four less than Andrew guessed, $17,023.11 less than what OG guessed, because it was only 296 bucks in 1955. That means Andrew slash Glenn just sealed the deal. I need, I need a source for that. Wow. <laughs> we actually got it from like, we actually found an amazing source for it from like a state study in California where they specified Folsom. That is way lower than I thought it was. Isn't that crazy? I think they were just, they were literally living on dirt floors and getting like porridge. That's why why we thought this would be. like Roomba classes and Peloton bikes and all of their cells. Did you say Roomba classes? Like like the vacuum cleaner? Like you... Classes on how to clean the floor. Yeah, you stand on top of the Roomba (laughs) and you gotta balance... Um, you ever see those people that clean a floor in a in a in a always changing direction? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, congratulations, Andrew. Nice, your first time on the show, and you help Len win win this year's trivia. I am so honored to 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 win this today, and I think I should uh, get the credit for the entire year. <laughs> He's like, I want the cake. He just Forget wants the cake. <laughs> I want the cake. Exactly. Paul, I think it was another lesson where um, if your gut is to cap somebody one side, go to the other one. <laughs> yes. I can't. <laughs> Doug, seriously, how many how many times has Paula gone? I think I'll take the wrong one by two dollars. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and, and she needs to watch that Seinfeld episode where Costanza realizes oh, every choice I've made in my life has led me here. So now I'm going to do the opposite. Whatever I think, I'm doing the opposite. That's and he right. walks over into this beautiful woman in the cafe and he's like, my name's George. I live with my parents and I'm unemployed. And she's like, do you want to go out? <laughs> and it worked. It worked. <laughs> That's it. So Paula, trust your gut, but in a different way next year, I think is good. Exactly. 
All right. Next year, next week's trivia then is going to be to see uh, to determine the order at the beginning of the year for week number one. Uh, so we'll do that. We'll do that order randomly. So whoever finishes first, second, third in our last week of trivia, we'll we'll do that one. All right. Second half of this uh, podcast episode is brought to you by DepositAccounts.com. Uh, Andrew, you know what happens when you go to DepositAccounts.com? No, I don't, but I can't wait to hear. <laughs> That's super. Uh, when you go to depositaccounts.com, you'll find that you can compare more than 275,000 deposit rates from over 11,000 banks and credit unions do it all for free. As we record this, which is a little earlier than you're hearing it, so you want to go to deposit accounts yourself, uh, the the national average in savings accounts has ticked up to an even half a percent. But if you're in the top 1% of savings accounts, you're getting 4.96, still a huge difference between that top 1% and the national average. And all you do, you go to depositaccounts.com, click on the different savings accounts, find out which one works for you in your area, and you're off and running. So depositaccounts.com. Isn't that great, Andrew? That sounds amazing. <laughs> he's he's got to come back every week. That's super. <laughs> all right. Let's, let's do this. This is obviously, when we talk about the death of retirement, that's a problem. What is, what is the thing when it comes to retirement? Andrew, let's stick with you. When it comes to retirement, for people that are maybe started late, what is the thing they're all worried about that you would tell them, maybe you don't need to worry about it that much. Let's just relax and, and not be so worried about blank. I think one of the, the biggest things that a lot of people are worried about is that they're running out of time. And we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier before, but I think they have a ton of time once you start to approach retirement age. And so because you can think of it in another you know, another age bracket, essentially, there is so much more time. You have 30, 40, sometimes even 50 years. My grandmother just hit 100, 100 years old. Wow. So you have so much time left uh, that you can really do some amazing, cool things uh, with that time frame. So worrying about that you're running out of time, I think is something that you really don't need to do. And I think a lot of people, you know, when they get to their, you know, 50s, you know, late 50s, 60s, 70s, they are worried about, hey, am I too old to start doing some of these things? And I think it is absolutely not true. I think a lot of people have a ton of amazing capabilities and that there's a lot of really cool things that you can do in that range. So I think you have so much time that you can still continue to invest your dollars and do a, a bunch of different things where you still have time for this money to compound and grow over that time frame. Oh, gee, what's another one? Maybe like, I, I don't know what to do or i don't have enough i don't have enough money to do anything right now and it won't make a difference like kind of throw your hands up in the air and say like joe said two million dollars there's zero chance i'll be able to save two million dollars so i'm not even gonna try and the reality is is that every little bit helps and compounding works very magically in the sense that a hundred thousand dollars invested for the next 50 years which is a long time is 25 million dollars like it's just impossible to think about how much compounding will will affect you and like andrew said from a timing standpoint you know that it's usually in that conjunction right it's like i'm 50 and i don't have a lot of extra so i might as well not do anything and i would say that's exactly the opposite attitude to have paula i think people get too caught up in what they should be investing in and uh fret about you know i don't know how to invest i don't understand the jargon of investing. Uh, what if my asset allocation is wrong? What the heck is al asset allocation anyway? Um, people get so caught up in wanting to be a great investor that they neglect to make contributions, right? Forgetting that, or perhaps not realizing that contributions are your single biggest determinant of investment success. And everything else, you know, picking the right invest ball, blah, 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 blah None of that matters if you're not making contributions. Yeah. To, uh, OG Chuck Wachendorfer on the show last week, I said either uh, I did know you're going to quote this, Paula, so I'm going to get this wrong, but it was either 83 or 87 percent. Do you know the number, OG? 83 or 87 percent of your success is based on what you do, right? The fact that you did it. And if you do it early, then then compounding interest will help. Yeah, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but it's yeah. a lot. Yeah, that's still big. It's still yeah. a big one. Paul, let's way, stick that, with that's you. That's 80-20 then, you know? Yeah, there it is. You're right. No. That's 80-20. Right on, yeah. Uh, 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 Paul, let's stick with you. Somebody stumbled on today's episode. They're just trying to get start. What should their first move then be? Now that we got them, okay, don't worry about these things. Just do it. What should your first move be? 
set up uh, retirement accounts. So any workplace retirement, a 401k or a 403b, if you're eligible for one, amazing. Whether or not you are, uh, set up either a, a traditional IRA or a Roth IRA. Um, set those accounts up. If your health insurance account is HSA eligible, set up an HSA as well. But get those tax advantaged accounts all set up and start making automatic contributions. Could be automated from every paycheck. It could be automatic monthly, but it needs to be automatic and at a recurring periodic interval so that you don't have to get your hands dirty. It just it happens while you're sleeping. Oh, gee, what's another one of those first... Yeah. What's another one of those first moves, OG? I like the idea of doing what Paula did and then telling your company to automatically increase your contribution at some interval, half a percent every six months, 1% on your birthday, you know, whatever those automatic escalating uh, contribution options are, because you will never miss 1% of your paycheck this week. I promise you, you won't even notice it. And in three or four years from now, you'll be maxing out your retirement savings. And the cool thing is, if you do, which, by the way, to your point, OG, never happens. If you do, you can always yeah, change, it. change it. Yeah, change, so it. change it later. Absolutely. Yeah. But I like that automatic escalation. Andrew, what's another first move? Another first move, I think, is along with the retirement accounts, I think that's the, the most important first move. And then along with that is looking for your employer match. If you don't know what employer match is, that's one of the, the number one things you need to do when it comes to opening up your, you know, your 401k or anything like that, because it is a 100% rate of return on your money. So taking advantage of that is definitely a huge, huge factor. And then in addition, building up your cash position over that time frame as well. So I would take care of those retirement accounts first so your money can start to compound, especially if you're approaching the age that you want to retire at. But then in addition, building up that cash position because cash allows you that flexibility over that time frame for your emergency fund or anything else, anything else that's going to happen to you. It's going to protect you against life and life is going to happen. It's not if something is going to happen to you, but when will something happen to you? So that is the biggest factor there as well. And so having that cash available is going to protect you in the long run. I love that emergency fund idea because, you know, with Paula and OGs set it and forget it. You can't forget it if you if you the the mufflers dragging behind the car and you got nowhere else to go for money exactly and it could interrupt your wealth building process if something like that happens and you don't have that cash available to you you could even have situations arise where you have opportunities where you could take a better job across the country for example to make a lot more money and people who don't have cash on hand cannot take advantage of some of these things and so it's really really important to make sure that you have that cash position available to you because life's going to happen like we said but at the same time you can also take advantage of opportunities okay paula said people don't know stick with you andrew people paula said people don't know where to invest they freak out about that totally 100 percent agree so let's give people some guidance there obviously we don't know you we're not your financial advisor but what investment do you think would be a great make a great first investment for somebody so i am of the the camp of index funds etfs those types of things but if you've never invested before something like a target date index fund is a really really easy way to kind of set up your investments on a set it and forget it system where you're just deploying money in a target date index fund and all it is is a way to to, to buy into a diversified asset that actually has a target date of when you're going to retire now the the uh, longer out that date is, the more aggressive that portfolio is. And then the shorter time frame in there is the less aggressive that portfolio is. So there'll be more bonds in that less aggressive portfolio. So that is one really easy way to just automate this process if you have never done this before. But I love index funds and ETFs as well. Things like S&P 500 index funds, total stock market, all those different ones. Yeah. Let's talk about lifestyle wise. Oh, geez. Is there anything we should do in our budget at the beginning? Anything we should do? lifestyle wise when we start thinking about i'm gonna i'm gonna try to create some money for myself when you're looking at your spending plan i hate the word budget because it's like the word diet and everybody hates dieting and everybody hates budgeting but a spending plan sounds a little bit more action oriented so when you're looking at your spending plan everything counts and i think some people will say well but i really like netflix so i don't want that part to count it's like no it counts just be okay with the fact that you're building this up from scratch. You get to decide at every dollar what you want to earmark that for. And there are no untouchable expenses. Like everything's on the table, lay it all out, build it up the way that you want to this time, because it's this month. It's the month of January, for example, in 2024, and you can build your spending plan however you want this month. Paula, people are going to fall off the wagon, so to speak. 
you fall off the wagon, you do this for a month or two, you screw something up. Wh what would you tell those people? Make it more automated and simpler, right? People often fall off the wagon. First, first of all, automation trumps everything, right? Automate first. And for the things that you can't automate, you then want to build habits around. But first automation, then habits. Second, so, so that's, that's the first step. Um, reassess where you can automate more. The second thing is for the things that you absolutely cannot automate and you are building habits around those, find how to simplify it. So for example, uh, when, when people have a, a budget or a spending plan, they will often uh, create all of these very particular categories, right? Because they want to know how much money they're spending on restaurants and how much they're spending on groceries and what they're spending on clothing and what they're spending on, right? And tracking your money in all of these line itemized categories can be incredibly exhausting. Plus it opens up these questions of, all right, what do I do? I spent $191 at Amazon and but those Amazon purchases were a combination of dish soap and socks and uh, dog food, right? So it falls into three different categories. It falls into what house homewares and clothing and pets. So what do you what do you do then? Do you break up the Amazon thing? Do you it like it creates all of this unnecessary confusion? And so dial it back, simplify it. I I tell people you want to take it to the extreme. You can simplify it to spending and saving. Those are your two categories, right? And then if you want to get a little bit more granular, that spending can go to, um, you know, it could, it could be fixed versus discretionary. Uh, it could be, you know, essentials versus options. I mean, there are a couple of different ways that you could do it. But the more that you can simplify, the more likely you are to stick with it. It's I'm I'm glad you say that, Paula, because you know what's what's funny is and and Andrew, you, Paula, I, OG, on on all of our podcasts, we've interviewed great people in the space. And Andrew, it it just seems to me the surprise I think for people when they start out is this is all about establishing confidence and about getting more and more confident. And to Paula's point, if you if you over I don't know if you make it too ornate, if you do try to do too much like that brings on fatigue, which can kill your confidence. Like, it seems to me that this is all about confidence. It 100% is about confidence, especially early on and just having the confidence to take these actions. But in addition, having the confidence to forgive yourself, because what a lot of people do is say they have a spending plan, for example, and they mess up their spending plan. They say, oh, I can't do this. They throw their hands in the air and they completely quit. And then they go back to their old habits. Yeah. But understanding that I have never had a perfect month with a spending plan. I have 15 Amazon boxes at my front door right now. I'm still <laughs> you know, bad with this stuff when it comes to some of this, this kind of thing. So overall, you really need to focus on forgiving yourself or like what they say in YNAB, roll with the punches and then move on to the next month. We are never going to have a perfect month. You need to understand that. And you need to understand that, you know, most people never have that perfect month. It is okay to make mistakes. You just move on to the next step. I think it's a fabulous place to leave it. Give yourself some grace. Let's, uh, let's find out what's happening where each of you are. I love hearing about some of the amazing stuff you guys are creating. Uh, OG, I know you're sick this weekend. You're going to, you're going to still power ahead with a, with a party holiday weekend. Absolutely. You got to spread my holiday cheer to everyone. <laughs> this time it's holiday cheer plus virus. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Who doesn't like a cold at Christmas time? Come see OG. It is fantastic. Santa brunch this weekend. If I feel better, that's what we're going to do. Hopefully. Uh, Paula, what's happening? We'll go to our guest of honor last. Paula, what's happening at the Afford Anything podcast? On the Afford Anything podcast. So we have aired an interview with uh, Dr. Mike Massimino, who is a NASA astronaut, who was also on the Big Bang Theory. We've also interviewed Jamila Soufrant, the host of the podcast Journey to Launch, who has just come out with a new book. Actually, uh, as of the time that we're recording this, I saw her last night. Um, at her book launch party. So awesome. and it was an incredible. I mean, the turnout was, was Matt, like, wow. You know, it was like getting hot in the room. I was like, darn, I should have like not worn a sweater, you know, in the middle of December. Um, right. It was, it was a amazing turnout. Uh, 
great discussion, great food, just yeah, fantastic. So, so uh, oh, and and her book, of course, is uh, the title is about financial freedom, but it's also about buying the darn guacamole, right? Why, <laughs> uh, why it's okay to spend the extra dollar when guac is extra. Guac does not need to be part of your retirement plan <laughs> or does need it to be does. part of your retirement plan. It does. Gross. Yeah. You, you should have your own chef making guac for you fresh but every avocados day. Avocados are only like 90 cents a piece, right? <laughs> Can't you just get an avocado and smush it up yourself? Wouldn't that be a smarter latte factor? I'm going to write a new book. It's called The Avocado Factor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Have you, th there's a restaurant in Texarkana where they will make the, they'll make the guacamole in front of you. Mm -hmm. And, and I saw them do that once and I'm like, I totally just need to do that. Cause it just looks like fun. It, it super Making looks guacamole. like guacamole. Yes. No. I mean, it's just taking avocados and smush them up, add a little bit of salt and pepper and, and onion, onion, tomato, and, uh, and onion, garlic, tomato. Garlic, tomato. Yeah. That's yeah. Adding all that stuff. Yeah. Oh my God. Are, are, are we hungry? I feel, like, we I feel like on here? somebody's hungry. No. How do you I do did, like guacamole though? I will. That's gross. <laughs> it's fantastic. Doug's a dork. He doesn't like guac. And I all like of those the and the, all those and the guac at afford anything, at afford anything where finer podcasts are Andrew. It is about time. My friend, I'm so happy you joined us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. This was uh, so much fun. And I've been listening to this show. Like I said, I told you off air earlier. I've been listening to this show since I was working in my nine to five way back in the day in the middle of a cubicle. So I'm, I'm so excited to be here. It's awesome. We're, we're the show's so much better with you here. Uh, we got to make sure this that uh, in 2024, we do this more often. But what's happening at the Personal Finance Podcast? So we uh, had a, a bunch of great interviews recently. We just had Paul Merriman on and we were talking I about love that, uh, man. small cap. Yep, he, he's the man. Um, and so we were going through uh, small cap stuff and kind of diving deep into that. And then we had friend of the show, Doc G, on just oh, recently yeah. as well. Um, so he was on uh, last week. Or, and so uh, that was a great interview. We were talking about how much is enough and how to figure out what that number is, which is a great conversation for what we were talking about today. Speaking of, and by then, the way, uh, next... Andrew, older people doing what the hell they want. I don't know how old Paul Merriman is, but that's a guy who just loves what he does. And he just keeps doing it and doing it and doing it. He absolutely does. He said he was in, he's in his mid eighties. I think now he's yeah. getting, he's getting to his mid eighties now. And he was as sharp as anybody ever is. Oh, so, so that's charming. a great example of longevity for sure. Yes. Cause I think it's just, it's just really, really cool. Yeah. Um, so he was amazing on there. And then next week we're, we're doing our 75 day challenge, which we do at the, at the beginning of every single year, which is kind of 75 days of getting your money right. So if you've never done this stuff before and you want to get your money right, that's what we do is our 75 day challenge at the beginning of every year. That's such a great idea. Maybe we need to modify our 75 days of getting it wrong challenge. There you go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's, that's, that's where we went wrong. Damn it. And now Andrew's got it the right way. Yes. That's a great challenge. So is it one thing a day? How does that work? So we modeled it after, if you remember, like, if you've ever heard of 75 hard, which is like a fitness and, and, you know, challenge where you, yeah, I prefer like 75 medium, but anyway, <laughs> yes, exactly. So we kind of did the, a similar thing, um, where we kind of did a hybrid approach where you're kind of getting your money, right. You're reading 10 pages a day. And then in addition, you know, you're doing one workout a day. So we kind of did health, wealth, and fitness at the same time. That's a fabulous challenge. And, you know, we'll link to the personal finance podcast yeah. and your website and awesome YouTube channel on our show notes at stackybedjamins.com. All right, lots of lessons to stack here, but uh, what are the top three, Doug, on our to-do list? Uh, Joe, don't get any big ideas like for some like company team retreat 75 days. I, I can only do one thing 75 days in a row. Uh, so what's, what's that? Is that trivia? It's brushing his teeth. Okay, we'll go with that. Sure. First, take some advice from our mentor, Andrew Giancola, and realize that because of that pesky increase in life expectancy, you have more time than you think to save for retirement. You can start investing now and your money will compound and grow to make your senior years more comfortable. Second, take it from Paula, only in the context of retirement planning is longevity a liability. So if you don't feel like making contributions to your investments, put that money into daily butter burgers and custard from Culver's. But what's on my to-do list? Get myself a touring agent to take my magic show on the road. That's what. All kinds of prisoners are going to love watching me turn raw metal into license plates.
Thanks to Andrew Giancarlo for joining us today. You can find his podcast, the Personal Finance Podcast, wherever you're listening to me right now. We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. Thanks to Paula Pant for hanging out with us today. You'll find her fabulous podcast, Afford Anything, wherever you listen to finer podcasts. And thanks to OG for joining us today. Looking for good financial planning help? Head to stackingbenjamins.com slash OG for his calendar. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2023, and is created by Joe Salcihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. This show was written by Lisa Curry, who's also the host of the Long Story Long podcast, with help from me, Joe, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. Kevin Bailey helps us take a deeper dive into all the topics covered on each episode in our newsletter called The 201. You'll find the 411 on all things money at The 201. Just visit stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Wonder how beautiful we all are? Of course, you'll never know if you don't check out our YouTube version of this show, engineered by Tina Eichenberg. Then you'll see once and for all that I'm the best thing that ever happened to this show. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Of course you do. Mom's friend Gertrude and Kate Youngkin are our social media coordinators, and Gertrude is the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. Not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show.